Good show on the road. So, thank you all again for coming out to Tampa Devs. Uh, we've got a few things on the agenda today. We're going to give you a quick rundown of Tampa Devs for those of you that are new. And then we'll give you some updates about upcoming events and programs. And then we're going to hand it straight over to Priscilla for an amazing talk all about observability. So if this is your first exposure to Tampa Devs, what you should know is that we're a nonprofit community for software developers. And we're trying to do good by basically making resources and educational materials and so on available to everyone uh, just to support their career growth, their continued education, and the success of Tampa's technology industry in general. We are a registered nonprofit, so here's all of our information about that. It also means if you donate to us, you, can, you get a write-off. And our vision and uh, kind of what we see our impact being is that we'd like to continue hosting bigger and better events. We want to help Tampa Bay succeed as essentially the leading technology hub of the East Coast, and we believe this is possible. And we want to create career building educational experiences for our members, much like this one. So some other upcoming events. We have DevFest Tampa Bay. This is hosted by the Google Developer Group. Uh, so this will be at USF, and um, it will be on the 21st of October. You can find more information about this in Slack, and we'll also be pushing it out in an update on our emails, email newsletter shortly. Continuing on, we've got a networking event on the 25th of October. This will be at Armature Works. These are so fun, so definitely recommend coming out to those. Our next tech talk will be on the 15th of November, and this is going to be all about computer architecture. So this is really cool, and this is hosted by a good friend of ours. His name is Joey Davila. Um, he works at Okta, and he is a really fun presenter, so you'll love this talk. And then our November networking event will be at Green Bench in St. Petersburg, uh, and we're going to start doing that trading off between the other side of the bay and here, uh, just so we can cover everybody. Another important thing is Bay Hacks. So this is our annual hackathon. You may remember in 2022, we hosted a hackathon here at Bar Collective, which drew over 120 people out uh, to build different projects. Bay Hacks is our next generation Tampa Devs hackathon. This is completely organized by Tampa Devs. And this will be in January or February of next year. We're, we're hammering out some of the fine details on the venue. Uh, and this is going to be fantastic. So we've already raised $6,500 in support of uh, this event and we're really excited to bring it here to Tampa. So, mentorship program. Uh, now we're up to 16 or so active pairings. Uh, this is actually old data, so this, this should be more close to like 45 sessions. But we have a free mentorship program for those of you who are either looking to be a mentor to folks that are maybe in different parts of their career journey in software development, or if you're looking for some assistance in your own uh, path you know, into software development, this is completely free. Uh, we use this platform called Together. It matches folks by, uh, based on interest, and, and you can kind of go through and, and find whoever you think would be the best mentor for you. And it's a great free resource uh, to help you connect with your peers and get the support and the advice that you'd like uh, from someone that you think really represents where you're trying to go. Now online, we do have a Slack. This has over a thousand developers in it, and it's a fantastic venue digitally to connect with folks in the area. You can post about your projects, you can get advice and seek that out. If you just go to go.tampa.dev slash slack, you'll have uh, a link to basically join the discussion there. If you're looking at other great meetups in the area, we have this page called tampa.dev, and that has us and a ton of other really great meetup groups that might be more specific to different platforms and technologies uh, that are active in the Tampa Bay area. This is great. Definitely check out those groups as well, especially if you're looking for a more specific community around a technology that you're very passionate about. We do have an online store. We've got merch, so if you like these cool shirts and bandanas and things, that's definitely worth checking out. And uh, we do accept donations, which again are tax deductible because we are a registered 501c3 with 509A2 public charity status. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we have an active GitHub with a bunch of public repositories. So if, if you'd like to do something like contribute code to our, our public website or something, get some open source contributions under your belt, this is a great way to do that. It's super low pressure and basically all about having fun. 
And finally, we've got all of these wonderful social platforms that you can connect with us on. Uh, so we're on basically everything from Meetup to LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, etc. We also have this really cool official job board. So this is actually our primary source of funding for Tampa Devs. And it's completely optional. Basically, we have um, over 100 folks that have already made public profiles on this platform. And um, we're slowly acquiring customers since we launched in uh, the 1st of July. But basically, we help you get jobs and we get a 5% placement fee. And then that goes directly into supporting our nonprofit programs. And we also donate 1% of our revenue directly to climate initiatives. So this is probably the most socially responsible hiring service of any kind at least in the state of Florida. And it's pretty cool, so check it out. Completely free to make your profile. Finally, if you'd like to share your knowledge at a Tampa Devs event, maybe give a talk, please hit us up. You can email us at speakers at tampadevs.com or you can go to go.tampa.dev slash speak and that's where you'll find our session eyes and you can actually submit your session there. So that is everything that I had uh, as far as you know, kind of bootstrapping the event. Thank you again, everybody, for coming. I'm going to turn it over to Priscilla now so that she can talk all about uh, observability and, and the wonderful work that she's doing at Elastic. So let's give her a big hand. All right, let's, we'll switch you over to this guy. So here's your cable. Yes, I would say. Thank you. Of course. And then um, put this up. Is the buzzer working? Huh? Is the buzzer? Uh, yeah, that, that should work. No, I did it wrong. Just a second. <laughs> okay. Here it is. I promised that we tested before. <laughs> Where is the microphone? Can you hear me? Is it fine? Yes. Okay, cool. You don't need the microphone. I don't need it? I don't think we're ever hearing it through the microphone. You just have... Well, I'm hearing you. Well, yeah, I can hear you. Just you can hear you fine? Yes. Okay, cool. Let's go ahead then. Is it being recorded? Should I look and say hi to someone? No? <laughs> okay. <laughs> fine. So let's get started then. Uh, first of all, my name is Priscilla Parodi. I am a developer advocate at Elastic. So we are the creators of Elasticsearch, for those who don't know. Um, and this is my LinkedIn profile. So if you want to know a bit more about the company or about me or uh, connect and ask questions about this presentation or something else, just feel free to connect. And uh, I think that, I'm, I mean, I will share the content here but i think we are not like many so you can definitely stop and ask questions in the between this won't be a problem and should they uh, oh wait just a bit so people can scan this fine nice. all right and today we're going to talk about observability so the question here will be what is observability right is this 
monitoring with a new name. So I want to ask you all, like, what do you think that is observability? You all know what is it? Is this something new for you? Who knows what observability is? Let's start from there. No one? A little bit. Zero? A lot. Um? A little bit, a lot. I think that observability is the child of a match. When the people from Monte Carlo create all this stuff, one of the things that they try to, to push was observability. I also think that observability is very bad use. Um, I was in January here in a very big meeting. I don't know if somebody here was also with the <coughs> was a, a cyber security meeting here in January. I don't know, maybe it was more than 1,000 people for different place and got some people for different. And I was asking people there, uh, do you know what is our survivability? Nobody knew. And I seen that cybersecurity could use our survivability very well. Yep. You're right. You're right. It makes sense. I was recently hearing about it in the context of microservices and uh, being able to observe the state of a network of microservices sort of all at once. Cool. Let uh, me ask you. Uh, it seems like all of the microservices are right into a database. They have a common or something. Yeah. That might make it, make it easier. Exactly. Um, I, I, I'd say it's more a knowing what's going on on uh, your systems, mm -hmm. um, being able to uh, visualize um, the, all, all the processes running and, and the, uh, the state of, of the services, right? Um, it's, that's, I, th I think that's part of it. I, I, I'm, I'm afraid we, we won't have time, but let me do one thing then, because I'm a bit curious. Can we just go for a round here, just for people to say like the name and what they are working with, like the industry, if they work with, like if they're developers, if they work on infrastructure, monitoring, can we, like 10 seconds for each, just for me to get to know you, because then I can <laughs> adjust the speech a bit more. Uh, does it make sense? Can, we, can I do this? Okay, I got the authorization. Can we start from there? Yeah, sure. My name is Mitch. Uh, I work for uh, U.S. Telecom DOD. Uh, I am a Kubernetes architect and administrator. Cool. Uh, my name is uh, Daniel Vasquez. I, I also work for uh, U.S. Telecom. Um, my I, I'm, I'm a dev DevSecOps uh, cloud engineer, so I'll, I'll take care of infrastructures and, and deployments, and mostly observability and monitoring. Cool. Great. I mean, okay. I am an enterprise, enterprise architect, an independent enterprise architect. I work for different companies, big, small. I am one of the software architects that's created the health benefit for the Veterans Affairs of Canada. I work here uh, in the United States since 2000. Last time as I did developer what, uh, development was 20 years ago. I did operation and development, and sometimes I come to this meeting, and I wonder uh, is uh, operation and development, they can get together mm -hmm. at last. That's great, that's it. Hey guys, my name is Carlos. Uh, I just spent over 10 years with Lexus. I am not a developer. And but uh, one of the things I was telling uh, the guys earlier is that there's a lot of opportunity in the car business. We're like stuck in 1985, mm -hmm. so um, I have no idea what observability is. Uh, I just want to meet some developers, you know, make a few friends here, and understand a little bit of the topic. Mm -hmm. May I make a comment? The CEO of uh, Ford many years ago say Ford is not a car company. It's an IT company, and every see a Star Wars. And well, I have a, a Civic 2023. Sometimes even I have to fight with the Civic because 
don't want it to, to change light. And cars are becoming really IT factors. It's, it's amazing what you are doing with the car. So it's only a comment, sorry. Oh, hi, uh, my name is Phil. So I'm working on a computer vision related startup uh, mm -hmm. with a USC uh, incubator at USC. And also I have a day job. I'm doing uh, data science and AI for an insurance company. My name is Craig. <clears throat> I'm an IT headhunter here in Tampa Bay. Mm -hmm. So that's what I do. We can move on it. Uh, Tom Soros, uh, I own a small uh, primarily government contracting firm uh, doing work space, but also some uh, state work as well. Uh, the big thing that we're uh, kind of looking to do is meet up with folks like you guys and kind of make introductions. And kind of My name is Tymon. Um, I'm a web developer. Web developer. Yep. Well, my name is Scott Nancy. Um, I work in the infrastructure side of things as a network administrator and um, I do it for the city. Um, me? Yeah. Brian? QA, mostly Python and open source. Mm -hmm. yep. I'm Michael. Uh, right now I'm doing uh, textbook development for uh, computer technology field. Mm -hmm. um, also, yeah. Michael, Turkara, data scientist, surprised I call myself a data engineer. Um, I'm a contractor of a LLC that I'm kind of just a, you know, thinking about growing into more than just one employee. Um, I had contractors with a, a primary care health provider network called myself, and I've been doing a lot of work with myself Azure, um, figured out how to do optical character recognition on your data documents in a couple of days, um, running a bunch of computer nodes. And so I'm kind of, because they're a Microsoft shop, I'm now like self-taught Azure expert. <laughs> and uh, someday we'll be able to do NLP on what's actually in the documents. And I, oh, I'm also, uh, sorry, but I'm also um, the organizer of Tampa Bay Data Science Group. Mm. And we're always looking for speakers on data science subjects. Frank gave us a great talk last night. And Hi, um, we also always kind of just like this group, we're, we're kind of, he showed, our logo on the slide there. So we're kind of semi-partners and we're always looking for sponsors and all that other stuff. If any of you guys, um, I mentioned, a couple of you mentioned AI and I see you mm -hmm. have data science in your title. So would love to talk to you if, if you'd like to get another venue to give a presentation. Thank hey you. Hey everybody, my name is Mushvik. Um, I'm a web developer. I'm currently working in FinTech off of a company in Arizona. We have a great mix here. If it was one company, I would say it's kind of almost complete. That's great. This is an awesome group. Yeah. <laughs> awesome, awesome. That's that's great. And uh, and talking about like observability, when I was asking you if you know this, I think that as mentioned, like it makes sense for actually many areas. Like it's not something that is just for one part of the things to understand, but actually. I did this same thing here. And actually, when I talk about observability, based on your questions to his question, uh, his answer is specifically like when talking about monitoring, this is a common question, like is observability monitoring? So that's why I want to explain it a bit and the difference and I want to start a presentation from there. And then you see that there will be things including AI related stuff here, that you see that will make sense and you start to see that actually makes sense for different areas. So let's start from the beginning because I'm not like sharing everything right now, but then you start to understand how you can start using this too. So let's talk about monitoring then. I think monitoring, we are all used to the word, even if you're not uh, working in an IT area right now. Uh, we are using it with the word monitoring. So here is a monolithic architecture. So we, it's not a microservice. It's not distributed. We have like, I got this example from Uber. They started with something uh, similar. 
So basically they had, let's see the point it works here. Oh yeah, it works. Not on the TV, fine. Uh, so basically they had like the, all of the services, uh, the endpoint there, the database, one database, and it was everything. And then considering this, if there was a problem, an alert generated this, okay, the service is down, and then there is an alert. In this case, let's simulate here the payment method. It's not loading. Someone selected a payment method, and this thing is not loading, so there's a delay, and the thing's not working anymore. Then what happens is someone try to understand what's going on. So after a while, you have the resolution time, you have the escalation, everything that happens in the between, and then you find out that it was, for example, a syntax error. So you talk to the database team and then they fix this and that's fine. Okay, it's working again. Whereas for a microservices architecture, and this one I also got from Uber, you have a bunch of services here and then in the same way, but now you have like the passenger management as on service, uh, web UI, everything that's here. And then if there is a problem here, you see that even a separate services, things are affecting the others. So like some of the operation here is down, for example, they might have like different databases anyways. Uh, but in the end, because of it, they probably have a lot of different tools, a lot of different systems, a lot of different integrations and teams probably. And in the end, they'll need uh, global testing, they'll need a coordination between the teams and in order to solve this situation. For them, solve this. So new tools, new solutions, every time that we add something new, I just talking about uh, AI here. So every time there is more, uh, with it comes new challenges. So in these challenges, when it comes to operations, is, is a great one, I would say. So when we were talking about like digital transformation a while ago, like how do I monitor apps for my business process? Cloud, um, I, I say like a while ago because like everything in IT seems like yesterday, I would say, but how do I monitor apps in public cloud? Uh, serverless, the function as a service, how do I monitor these? Containers, microservices, cloud native, how do I do this? So every time is something uh, new and then how do I make, uh, how do I do this? How do I monitor this? How do I make sure that this thing is working and that nothing is breaking here? So the question here was at that time, well, how to go from this reactive monitoring that we just saw to a proactive monitoring uh, to then identify potential issues before they create major challenges. With this question and with this uh, problem or challenge, I would say, observability started to become a concept. So this is not a technology, this is not something that I want to sell you observability or something like this, it's more a concept. So is your system observable? Do you have observability in your company? This might be a question, like someone might ask you, like, is your company observable? This is something that uh, people ask nowadays, and this was, I would say, like around two years ago, a buzzword, like ChatGPT is today, when it comes to the ops word, I think like he's saying yes, he's probably um, aware of it, because it, it became like a buzzword uh, in the operations world, because uh, it was something really popular. And actually, <coughs> If I ask, if I put the same question on Google, you can see that there are different definitions here. So even when you ask the companies like New Relic, for example, what observability is, they say, well, observability is proactively collecting, visualizing, and applying intelligence to all of your metrics, events, logs, and traces. Uh, Red Hat say something uh, similar, but still different. They don't mention the proactive word here. Ability to monitor, measure, understand the state of a system or application by examining its outputs. Uh, Solar with another one. Ability to provide insights, automated analytics, actionable intelligence. 
Um, Cisco uh, modern applications that use software tools to detect issues before they become problems. You can see the same idea in the background here, the same intention. And this is actually the goal here. In the end, I will provide you my favorite, but know that there is no like right and wrong here. But I do have a favorite, the favorite definition for observability. Uh, so how it started uh, and what is uh, the point of it? So basically, uh, there are many papers around these, and Twitter was one of the pioneers of like defining these. But not just Twitter, like some collaborators too, like some other companies in the Silicon Valley and all of it also collaborated to define these at first. But as you can see, even as part of these definitions, it's broad and then depends on who defines this. But what we have as something that everyone agrees is that actually it started as these three pillars and these three pillars are really part of observability. So if, for, if you want to have a system that is observable, then you need to consider these three pillars first things first to then improve this from there. So these three pillars are basically the logs, the metrics, and the traces, the APM. So let me explain a bit, mainly for those uh, who are not from the industry, but also those who are not familiar. But who knows what logs is here? A good part, right? And you're using logs, right? And you know how to use these. And, 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 you, and, and you do this. You make sure that you print the logs, whatever. OK, cool. This is a good part here. So logs, for those who don't know, but also like remembering here, revisiting the topic, they're generated for each occurrence. So basically, I, I define it as for each event, print what happened. So print out what happened. There are some pros here in, uh, in the end because it will provide a comprehensive record of all events and error that happened uh, during the life cycle of uh, the software resources. And another pro here is that you can customize it. So you can uh, make it unique. You can uh, do it the way you want. Uh, the cons here is one, if you don't code it, then it isn't printed. So that's why I ask it, because like I think that even some people know, but sometimes we just don't do this. But there's another point that is even important. I mean, more important than this one, which is the format of it. So, um, I mean, we have different ways of communicating as human beings. So sometimes, like if you are collecting logs from an application that you have no idea of who was the person printing these logs, you might think that, well, this thing is too generic. I don't know what's going on. Like, I don't know what's happening here. And then it's not available anymore. So this, is, this might be a problem when it comes to logs. Metrics. On the other hand, metrics are measurements that define the health and performance of applications or infrastructure. I always put the example here, but basically every X seconds, for example, measure the CPU load and print it out. That's basically it. So you have this track, like in a hospital that you have like the, the bits per minute and et cetera, I can correlate this somehow. Uh, for those that are from different industries here, but this is basically uh, how it does that. And then the pros here is one, the real time insight into the state of the resources you have. The other one is it can be used with simple alerts. So it can generate an alert from there. Okay, if it's more than X, do this, do that, generate its alert, etc. So it's kind of like easy to generate because it's a metadata. Uh, and then you can catch incidents, you can uh, generate anomalies, for example, from there. And the cons here, one I can mention, is that metrics can only keep, keep track of the application and infrastructure data that they are designed to record. So if there is something that they're not designed to record, you won't have the data, so you'll be missing this. Uh, the other part here is the metrics aren't typically useful for pinpointing the source of a problem. So especially in a complex distributed system, metrics only shows that the app is experiencing errors. 
So you see, for example, the CPU load, you see that something is going on, something is off right, like the traffic, etc. but then fine, thanks. Like what is the problem here exactly? Like what is really going on at this time? What caused this uh, to happen? So this is the question that uh, you might have right after seeing something like this. Then the other pillar, the third pillar here, the traces. So traces are records of activity within an application code. It tracks an application request as it flows to, through the various part of an application. So basically we have a request here uh, and then you have a response. If it is a 500 to generic, okay, you have a black box inside. You don't know what happened. You don't know what cause it is. You don't know uh, what generated the delay in the between the services that were part of it. So there used it to be before these black box, but of course with three. Let me interrupt you a minute. So we don't have here linkage, something that the people from, so data professional, they have something that they call governance mm -hmm. and catalogs and all this stuff. But of course, these are, are static. You are talking here about something that is very dynamic, mm -hmm. very difficult to do. But I have a lot of trouble with black boxes. Why? Because if we don't know what is there, we are not sure that something is going OK. So how do we know that the trace is OK is everything that we are getting is from the black box? It's from what, sorry? From the black box. Okay, okay, yeah. So basically, let me go ahead and talk a bit. I will explore this traces topic. Sorry, maybe there is no an answer. Sometimes I, I, I am in your place also. And people tell me, say, I don't know. There is no answer. Sorry, guys, we don't get to this level yet. Yeah, yeah. And this black box are act is actually a challenge here. So that's why we try to get some insights with traces. So let's, I'll go ahead and explain a bit of traces sure. and then uh, we can talk about like. Is traces like, for the way, an to stack traces, can't you, is that what you're referring to with, with this definition of traces? Yeah, everything in the application level. So that happens in the between. So you have like the, the request, you have the response. So all of the database calls here, everything, uh, the other services that you call in the between uh, are part of these traces that you collect. So, so you not have- Not necessarily like an error being thrown in like a Java stack trace or something where it's like an out of, out of bounds error at- If there is an error to you, so there are two things here. I, I just don't, don't want to give like all of the spoilers before, but basically uh, there you have like the automatic collection and uh, instrumentation and you have the manual. So if you want to add another span, then you can do this manually. If your agent is supporting everything that you already need, then you don't need. So it's, it's something that you can customize in the end, but so usually for the Yes, depending on the agent, it will support more or less, but you can also manually instrument the application if you want. So basically, when it comes to traces here, uh, I define these as for every transaction, track all of the components that, was, that were part of this transaction uh, and the time it took to complete each step. So <clears throat> here, as you can see, like there is a transaction so there are some spans that I will explain a bit what it is, but some methods here that are part of this call. And then another transaction, uh, like calling a database, for example, the web server in the between, uh, calling another service. So everything that is part of this transaction, and you have the response, even if it means that it was not exactly what you were expecting, something uh, is not working, for example, and there's a delay, you don't have the, the, the response, but in the end, it navigates through uh, the request. So the pros here, one is it's very detailed information, so it will lead uh, directly to the root cause analysis, so you can, uh, okay, there is a delay here in the database request here, so I can see uh, what's going on and check it and fix this. Uh, the other point is the automatic instrumentation. 
Uh, so when it is supported by the agent, of course, so popular libraries and fr frameworks, for example. So you can check uh, the options for agents and then you can select the one that makes sense uh, if you want the automatic instrumentation. Uh, the cons here, one, to add more metadata, manual instrumentation is required. So if you have something else that you want to add, then you would need manual instrumentation, meaning that you need to create your own span. Um, and then different agents here, uh, which are language and framework is specific. So this is a point here uh, for you to pay attention. There are lots of vendors outside and all of them, including Elastic, Elastic is a vendor for this too. Uh, so they have like agents for different languages, for example, and then you need to check it out. And if you have like a, a service, like a microservice architecture, for example, with many different languages, it might uh, translate into using different agents too. So all of it needs to be taken into account, but this is how it works for traces. The, the, the instrumentation application level. So it's, it's basically the, what was the question, sorry? The uh, are, are you, is there instrumentation code within the actual client side piece of the code or is it more, are you talking about the server side type instrumentation? It, it's the client side. The client side, okay. Yeah. Let's talk about the terminologies now. Uh, so when I say trace it here, it's mainly the description of a transaction, inbound requests, outbound uh, database calls, and so on. So everything that's supported in the between. Uh, when I talk about span, it's a name it, time it operation representing a piece of the workflow, uh, one of the events, a method here. Uh, distributed trace it that uh, I talked with some of you uh, before. So it's basically when a trace navigates through multiple services. So in a micro microservice architecture, for example. And how uh, it will propagate the context. So it will do that by propagate, propagating the ID. So you have like a parent ID, and then this ID navigates through there until it's over, until you have the response. Um, and then the ID is itself, which represents the spun relationships in a trace. So this is basically uh, like, of course, it depends on the vendor, this, the way you're going to visualize this. Uh, for this one, uh, I'm using Kibana, so in the in Elastic Stack, but this is the way you should be seeing these, like all of this step by step here. And as you could see, like you can use different uh, clients here, you can use uh, different services here, and then you can see like this by color, for example, when it comes to, to Elastic, or anyways, divided this by service. So then you have like all of this step by step, and you have the response in the end for you to track what's going on. This is a, one example of a span. So we have like a post degrees call here. So select uh, some uh, customer full name, etc., from customers. So this is one example for a span. And the trace ID. Mm -hmm. So you have like, for example, different IDs here, uh, which will basically be something like this. This is something that I like to talk about here, which is different ID formatting will depend on the vendor and it will generate a vendor lock-in. So this is a concern for many companies because I've been talking about uh, the vendors having agents. We have a lot of agents to offer. We are a vendor here. So, and, uh, and it's good to talk about our agents and uh, what we offer and what are the options, but at the same time, sometimes it is like, well, fine, but at the same time, if I use the Elastic agent, and then if I start using another uh, solution, uh, what is the point, like how can I communicate or something? Well, you can't, 
actually because in the end the ideas will be different so you can integrate so you need to choose the one that works best or anyways it won't work because we are not integrating like when it comes to the vendors itself so this is a problem I would say um, and then to solve these to help us solving this we have a concept here that I want to share called open telemetry so this is really cool uh, it's basically a framework designed to create and manage telemetry data not just traces but also metrics and logs uh, and you can see that it's open so it's from the cloud native comp computing foundation so you can see that's out there you can check their repository uh, to get more details but they came from this challenge, the challenge of making sure that there could be a way of having vendor neutral agents that could work with the vendors. Is this concept new for everyone or is someone familiar with open telemetry? I'm not familiar with that, but the idea of standardizing stuff is, is pretty common. Yeah. So. Not really, but there there is something uh, somehow like there is exporter thing that, that oh. I will show in a few, and then you see how there is the communication here. Oh, that's because the vendor, vendor has to exactly, exactly, so, exactly. So when it comes to vendor support here, there are these two possibilities. One of them is the vendor provides an exporter for the open telemetry collector. So this is one option. And the other option here is by building a receiver for the open telemetry protocol. So I would say that the vendors that are contributing the most to open telemetry, usually they already have a receiver for the protocol. So they skip this exporter part of the things. Uh, otherwise, they will just come up with the exporter. Let me uh, show you how the architecture will look like in this case here. So basically, you have for this one with the exporter. <coughs> oh, here, I think it's better. So for this one with the exporter here, you have you stole the SDKs for uh, the open telemetry specifically. So you want to install, for example, the Elastic Agent for a uh, Go for Node.js, you will install the open telemetry agent. And then you have the open telemetry collector that will work as a proxy here. And it will have the vendor exporter provided directly by the vendor. So you, you don't do anything when it comes to this. You already select the vendor that you want to use and use the exporter for the vendor that you are using. And then this exporter will communicate with the vendor protocol. So this is how it works basically. And there are many companies that will uh, show you some of them so it can help you to understand like the ones that are part of it. But these are some, but I will show you more later on. And the other option here, which is without the vendor exporter, so meaning that they already have a receiver for the protocol. Uh, so here, the SDKs, the agents, are already uh, communicating directly with the vendor because the vendor is already providing a receiver for the protocol. So nothing, there is no exporter in the between. When it comes to vendor support here, you can see that this is an open project. So every time that, for example, they add uh, a support to a new programming language or uh, a new agent, then we need to, or the companies, when I say we, need to provide like the protocol or the exporter, um, the receiver for the protocol or the exporter. So it means that we end up with more contributions. So the company that you see that are here, like first, second, third, anyways, that the top rank here are the ones that are contributing the most meaning that they have more support when it comes to the language. Of course, you can directly go navigate through the website of each of these companies, and then you can check it specifically to know what is supported, and, and then you see. But it's an ongoing process, even for open telemetry. Like, it started, I think, with just traces, 
and then and then metrics and now they are adding support to logs so not every single uh, language for example already has support to logs so it depends but as there is progress on their side there is progress on the agent side meaning that the vendors needs to contribute so that's why there is this list here that you can check and and see how the vendors are ranking and, and how often they are contributing it is a good time to choose a vendor that is part of this list because in the end uh, well if you don't choose this you're probably lock it in and it means that they care about like open source and all of this so yeah but there are many anyways like you can see i would say like a good part it's it's difficult nowadays to find one that it's not here but if it's not just uh yeah make sure that it's exactly what you're looking for do the uh, do the vendors are they responsible for kind of coding their own agents that the standard yes open delimitry does nothing like i mean they provide the the, the support in order for us to come up with it but otherwise it's up to us to 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 build it and in general are they are they pretty performant are they adding a lot of overhead to the, the user experience or are they pretty pretty performant in terms of the agents collecting performant you mean uh well you're adding stuff to a client side code right so you're adding time to what what's happening on the client side so are they is that adding a significant amount of overhead a little bit of overhead what's like performance like? did you answer his question directly this is all this is server side stuff on the application yes. back end. She answered it incorrectly. Oh, yeah. this is back end. This is all, uh, uh, back end front. And, yeah, but I think it's primarily like. Yeah, but okay, to, just, to answer your question, uh, open telemetry is lightweight. It's, it's pretty lightweight. It's, okay. it's yes. pretty lightweight, so there's not that much overhead. Because the data is already there. I yeah, mean, it's just exposing. It's literally just moving stuff. Just here exposing and there. data, and then you have like the exporter, which would be another. Yes, database. yes. Or and then you would also have like the crawlers, right? Um, just grabbing all that data, and parsing it. But but it's it's pretty good. Pretty good. Yeah. Cool. Yes, and, and it's like uh, from, for example, it will be like JavaScript. For example, if we have like a run use case, and then so it depends on like what is like the what do you want to build, but it's like back and front when it comes to traces. Oh, and, and these are some of the status and releases here. Uh, so you can check on their website based on what you want to implement. Uh, and then you can see if there is support or not. You won't find support for everything already. Um, I'm still learning about this, but it seems like problems that we can have in a microservice or like a distributed architecture or any big company, let's say, is the sheer amount of logs or mm -hmm. um, just the complexity or even like noise sometimes, right? Um, and, and adding more and more <coughs> abstractions, sorry, abstractions <coughs> in the middle, uh, sometimes couldn't seem, seem, could seem like it's like going the opposite of the way where you want to go. Does like uh, any of the vendors or standard do they have like any inherent ways of like making logs more um i guess like not readable but like easy to consume uh instead of like increasing their complexity where you have more and more <coughs> logs and you might have way more information that you might need as opposed to like a like you know this is the kind of issue that you face and you can step trace it within one microservice yeah, one of the things that uh, there are some uh, even talks about this is like the idea of going from logs to events, which is basically to have more metadata from logs. So you can work like in, in a better way when it comes to like more structured data than if it's, if, than if it's not. So this is like one way to go. Um, when it comes to, to logs itself. Um, and even like, uh, I will show one thing later on, which is uh, using like, for example, ML to categorize logs, <coughs> which is something else too that's been done. Like big corporations or 
So what are the vendors doing? Or they're just providing? Yeah, yeah uh, basically they will provide like the, the back end here. So for example, when you saw the, the UI there, this is the UI from Elastic, for example. So basically all of the data is being uh, stored into Elastic and then uh, the UI to being provided by Elastic. So they provide the ability to store these data and then you, for you to search and navigate through these two. So when you have, I mean, the, the top of the list for the, like the big ones, like Microsoft, Google. It's blank too, yeah. You're talking about like their cloud services have these things implemented? Yeah, they, they, they do. They, they do have the, the ability to work with agents, so they do have this as an offer. Yeah, and, and there, there are many there actually, this list is big, like it was just, actually by the way, it was just a print, like there, there is more. If you scroll down, you can see it's not everything, yeah. so, so then you can see the others that are part of the list too and, and also support this. But yeah, if they're there, then they're contributing, then they have something at least. I don't know exactly what they have, it depends. Uh, then you need to check the, to see like what they are supporting when it comes to open telemetry. But usually the, the top ones, like, I would say like first 10 or something, should support like the most part of it. So observability is full stack in the end. So it will bring all together. So here, for example, considering uh, here that you have a front end, a React front end, and, uh, and the back end of your application, the Django back end, then you can use APM, APM, the traces itself for this. Then you have like a database call here, and then you have like logs and metrics for the database. Uh, and then you have application server, and you have the, the hardware, the operation system, then you have like logs and metrics for these two. So in the end, it means that you are uh, generating, collecting data, generating data from every single aspect of it, so you have the entire picture. But then there is a question here, like are there any other pillars? Are there any other things that we can add here to make sure that we have more? And actually, yes, all the time. Like every time that there is something new, uh, then the intention is for it to, to also be considered uh, something observable. And here is something that uh, comes from this too. Uh, so how to go from this proactive observability to prescriptive observability. So to learn from events in this case. Then you can utilize something called AIOps. And basically for AIOps is like, the question is, uh, why do you want to consider AIOps as part of your observability strategy, for example? So one of the things, the reasons here is the data volume, because every day you have more. The other one is the complexity, because as he just mentioned, like it gets distributed and then you have like more services too. And the pace of change, so the rate that, uh, that it changes, it's uh, nowadays even faster. So it's, it's also something. And which observability use cases are best supported by AI ops? There are many possibilities here, but one, as I think he mentioned, the anomaly detection. So unexpected variations, latency, all of it can be supported by anomaly detection, understanding the anomaly. Uh, massive volumes of data, such as unstructured or semi-structured data can be classified or categorized, as I mentioned earlier and uh, multiple symptoms, events, and issues can be correlated to help cut down the noise from alerts so, and help you to uh, understand the root cause here. <coughs> Let's see how we are when it comes to time here. Just sh Okay, cool. So the benefits of AI ops here, Proactive incident management, efficient resource utilization, problem resolution, 
uh, availability, reliability, data-driven decision making. I think this is a very good one. And what is AI ops in the end? Is it, it is AI for IT operations. So basically, we talk about all of these, uh, the data ingestion part. More specifically, we focus it on the vendor agnostic data ingestion, if you can. And then you have, like, as part of this uh, cycle, you can use machine learning in order to get all of, this, all of it that I just mentioned, like anomaly detection, performance analysis, correlation, and everything, all of it. Let me go a bit back and explain what is AI, because I'm saying like AI ops, A, et cetera. I think it's, it's nice to just understand the concept here. So AI means artificial intelligence. So basically, it all started a very long time ago, actually. This is not new. Uh, the idea of artificial intelligence is to mimic human intelligence. So you have, uh, as part of it, uh, machine learning and deep learning that are actually subset of AI. So this is not something that is not related or a, is a different thing or something like this. So uh, when the person is saying, well, I'm, I have an ML solution or even ML ops that you might find there. So they're also referring to AI ops in the end. And then you have uh, machine learning actually started to become a thing when they were like, well, fine. Uh, there is this thing of like automating things, going with scripts, etc. But how do I actually skip this part of like knowing the output and go to something uh, that is already learning from the examples and not really from the instructions? So here is when statistics come here. And actually, this is all about math in the end, so it's not uh, magic. And then we have deep learning as a subset of machine learning that's also in this part here. And you can even add more circles if you want to separate here. But, but in the end, deep learning is also machine learning. And this comes uh, by also understanding like the human brain, the neurons and the connection. So to have this multi-layer neural architecture here, and there are many ways of implementing this too. So the idea is to use machine learning also uh, provide some insights when it comes to uh, the operations. So how does it learn? How does this thing learn? We have, actually there are three ways I would say, but the most common, there's like the same supervisor, supervisor that's something in the between. But you have like the unsupervised and the supervised way of learning here. So basically have all of your data, like the logs, metrics, everything that you're storing here. And then what happens next is a interpretation, which is basically understand the patterns to uh, have like some clusters here to understand like the characteristics of your data. And then the algorithm that, is, uh, that will be used is selected in order to process your data. And then by having these clusters, understand where the anomaly is, where uh, the thing that is out of pattern is. So uh, anomaly detection is a great example here when it comes to unsupervised learning. There is also the supervised learning. It's not that used when it comes like to monitoring, but it's to you. There are things you can do uh, in this side to you, like classification, regression, for example. Uh, models, so basically you have the label data. You already know uh, what you are expecting, like the kind of uh, analysis that you want to perform, is this a classification, is this a regression, like what it, exactly you are trying to perform. And then there, it process your data in order to generate a prediction to understand this. So these are the ways that it works basically. And when it comes to anomaly detection, it is unsupervised. A uh, good use case here uh, that it's possible to do is the ones with logs. So basically with anomaly detection. Uh, there is something you can use uh, with Elastic. There are other companies also offering something pretty much similar. But the idea, the logic behind this is the same, which is to categorize the logs. So this is like one example of categoriz categorization process. So you have the log here. 
And then the first step is it will not you, but it will remove uh, the mutable test, which is the one that is always changing, like the timestamp, for example, because it's not the relevant. It's always the same all the time. Uh, for this, to find this unique part of the things. And then once it finds this, it turns this into a category. And then you have like a lot of different categories there. Categories, and it understands like the behave, uh, behavior of all of these categories. It's able to put these, what we call it, in a bucket. So in, in a time frame, everything that happens in this bucket is, uh, is one part of the, the thing here, like one uh, piece of everything that is uh, happening. And then once you uh, are check, checking like the anomalies, you can see this per bucket. So you can understand like if there is an anomaly per bucket uh, to, and, the, and how important it was, if it was affecting another log, for example, etc. So then you can have like this um, and then do something with it. So in the end, I mentioned that I have like my favorite. So when it comes to the definition of observability, so this is basically the one I, I like to use, which is a set of principles for practically observing systems as a whole, which is a mix of the ones we saw earlier. And as you could see, like AI ops can be also part of it. So it can also support observability. First of all, it depends on like the vendor and the algorithms that they are using. But basically, being generalist here, like what you will need is like enough historical data for it to be able to identify patterns. Otherwise, it won't work. So if there is no pattern somehow like in your data, it won't understand this as one. And then you have like a lot of wrong anomalies. So uh, and then when it comes to logs, usually there is some pattern or there should be something. So this is also, uh, and that's why like it fits here for this scenario specifically. But, but yeah, you need to have like enough historical data for, for this to work, which is basically uh, you activate the, the anomaly detection service and you leave it there running. And then it will start to learn from there. So the first things you can just ignore for a while, once uh, when it's, it's basically like you can see the accuracy of the algorithm. Right. Once you have like a good accuracy, then you can say, okay, it's fine of historical data. It's now, uh, the probabilities now are, are making sense. So a follow-up question with that, and this might be more of a philosophical question. Um, regarding like consuming the, the code, the, like the agent, whatever it sees, uh, who owns the, the model at that point? Is that, are, are the AI um, models run on the vendor side? Or Something that the client, the user owns. You on the data, oh, of course, it depends on the vendor, etc. Like, it, it depends when it comes to Elastic, for example. Uh, you own the data, like, Elastic has zero access to your data, but we do have access uh, to the model because when it is proprietary, uh, when it's not out there, for example. So then the company has as access to the model, which doesn't mean basically the model will adjust like the, the lambda, will adjust like the, the weights, but that's it. Like it doesn't mean that it will send us information on your data itself. It is basically a formula and it will adjust the weights of this. So you have the model Yes. Okay. 
that's the supervised model though, right? Well, I think unsupervised. Unsupervised. Oh, that's unsupervised? This unsupervised. Perfect. Yes. This, this one oh. is um, um, usually like the ones for, there's the outlier, for example, which is not based on historical. Actually, you have like a lot of data, but you don't need to have like it over time. So this is another thing. Then for outlier, you have the option to have like semi-supervised model, which you can like add labels to. But, but for these specifically, it's, it's unsupervised. But are the vendors providing like pre-trained models? It's not. It's not uh, pre-trained. It. Actually, like it will learn based on your historical data. So we do provide the model, and we we do have like some features, for example, for timestamp, like identifying, etc. But in the end, uh, it will understand the pattern based on the logs that you are generating, and then from there, it will just adjust uh, the weights from the formula, basically, and, uh, and start from there uh, with the probabilities that uh, according to this. So like denial of service tag or something like that, is that something that you would want to detect? Sorry, what was it? Say it again? Denial of service attack, is that something that you would? Say it again, sorry. Denial of service? Denial? Where a lot of people are like overloading your website. Cyber security thing. Where they try and break out your website. When, when you get the a lot of requests all work. Yeah, when everyone yeah. comes in at the same time. Okay. Is that show sure. something you want to detect with this AI ops? Yeah, yes, 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 yes. Uh, and not just this, actually, like, well, if, if, you, if you have logs, like if, if it's something like simple with it, like if you have logs, then you can, then you can definitely do this. You can definitely use this too. If it's complex, if it's something um, very specific too, but in the end, like if you want to understand like patterns and, and generate anomalies from there, then you can do this with it. So this is, this is something, and, and not just with these, I talk about logs, but like if you're generating alerts, for example, and you want to also like understand if there is anomalies or patterns, every time that you have historical data and you want to uh, understand if there is an anomaly from there so it's able to identify the pattern and then you can understand if there's an anomaly from there. I have a question Priscilla. How you control the quality of the data that you are using in, the, in your models? This is a very good point, actually, that uh, in the end, it's, it's, I would say, like, better uh, somehow that you know, uh, like, some, or you track the quality of it, otherwise it won't be something that you... There is a lot of noise. Yes, uh, yeah. Well, when it comes to, I would say, like, logs, usually is a bit more predictable. When it comes to NLP, for example, that he mentioned before, it's a bit unpredictable because it's humans and it depends. So w we tend to s somehow like consider that if it's like machine written message, then it's a bit better. If it is like uh, human language, it's it's a bit difficult. And and then of course like uh, when you specifically talk like about logs from the same system all the time being generated, then that's fine. It's like there is a pattern from these and somehow something that makes sense. Uh, but if it's like data from all over around, like different systems and you really like, you can really like make sense of it, then this is a point to you. Um, in the end, like for example, if you are using like anomaly detection and uh, when you are choosing like the kind of analysis, you can select like if these like, a population analysis, meaning that it will take into account the behavior of others, or if it is like just a single metric analysis, if you just take into account its own behavior and historical behavior. So there are some, uh, I would say, like ways of making sure that it makes sense. And even like when you put your document, you can just select the fields that you want to. You don't need to select like everything. You can just select the ones that uh, that you want to analyze. I'm not necessarily talking about logs right now, but so so to that point, that's kind of what my question was. So after you've fed it in some data for a period of time and it's identified what 
there's the impacts that then you list that everything's kind of a very hard thing and I don't know if this needs to monitor for that particular pattern for that particular category of these things. Like is that in terms of date that's not great. But I don't think it's a couple of logs and then you do the opening of more yeah, 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 yeah. The only friend what, what we have is like depends on, on the vendor too. Uh, is some rules. So you can test some rules there. For example, if I have these two plus like more of the blue, then it's anomalous. And I know that and I want you to consider these anomal. Or every time that say uh, this uh like time is like pretty safe for example, or every time that it's like more for example, I don't see the things, but basically uh it will not be based for uh the model. So it will say that and we'll see it. Um but you see it to make sure they wanted to this because like other ways later example now yeah, for at least if it is internal, then what do you use? Uh, yeah, we actually use like the beam for school and uh, what else? So it's user, sure. so you select in a uh, browser player, so you select in... No, I do with you, for, for us, for users with you. Don't tip in here, I think I can show you um, some of these things. This is Anna, the uh, familiar. So today he is inside the last search. Uh, and the last if I have to access my business card, contact me. Yeah, because of your esteem, I don't agree with all the law. I would appreciate if you send me. Sure. Okay. Um, this is cheap. Okay, this is done. Okay, see? Okay, cool. Okay. In the words. Uh, Let's see if I zoom in. Yeah. So the, the services here. So we have like a front end and a node. And then we have like the the character. This call is here already using an emulation. So this call is here mean uh, the level of an only. So in this case, like 82, it, it goes from 0 to 100. It's normalized. So, and here it's 96. So you can see that it's probably affecting these two. There's anomalous. So in here, and then I'm navigating through the APM interface. So you can see the errors, the dependencies, which is only one in this case is Postgres. So it's somehow easy to understand like what's impacting here. And it's specifically about the product that doesn't exist and go the patent to order uh, to check what's part of it. So basically the Postgres is also about the uh, product catalog service here. And I go to this is the APM service, so I go to loss. And check anomaly too. Again, you can select the colors and uh, you can select how uh, this is for And then this one is that we're looking for all theory products, which is pretty much for work. Yes, yes. Okay. So here you can check, and there is this overview. Choose. And then the alert also like the log so grows more than what was there. So the rules. Uh, so alert indices can be generated by anomaly if the symbol also grows. So you can set the rule like any certain X generated the anomaly. Uh, so you need to have like, anomaly detection for every. When you read it, you can just use this. So that's like, so what anomaly like, what will generate alert then does really it's free to update a shinly node in circuit. It makes it that is not something that you didn't know or you are expecting. You can just read an alert. Sorry. Well, for you mean rules, right? Huh? I mean, if, uh, those could be rules. Like yes, yes. In the end, uh, we'll just like for the um, once your data is stored in True Elasticsearch, then you can uh, just like filter by this and then like the, the criteria for this to be or not considered. Yeah, if, if, if uh, you have something that's not uh, being stored. Uh, uh, so, oh. then you find part in password, right? Ah, oh, this is... Oh, I got it. Right. It's possible. It's possible. Um, the other thing that I want to show you that it did about is it's of the blocks uh, in the AM here. Um, to, to, so... Yeah, 
Yep. And, and you know, you, you give, it, give it the certificates for it to monitor and uh, you know, it'll alert you when it's about to expire. Yeah, or like you can, you can specify the exact amount of time where you know it, it's gonna send you the alert. That's the uptime. Yes, and uh, and actually, as you could see, like we put it all under the observability umbrella, in the end. So everything else that we add is part of it. Uh, yep, go ahead. Uh, okay, so is there is there a part B to this, which now that I've detected something, sending an alert is is one thing, but. Is there, I guess, is there an API or does this connect in with other tools then that I can use some self-healing on the system to recover the system, take it down, bring it back up, what, you know, whatever steps that you've done, a checklist to e do some other verification? Yes. But this is an automation that we, yeah, this is an automation that you do from outside. So you not do this with Elastic. Basically, like for example, when you generate, for example,
Well, there is an anomaly. This anomaly generates an alert. And then from this alert, you have integration. So you do have like webhook, for example. So, yes, so create a trigger which would then go to another system or tool exactly exactly it will create a trigger but actually like that you will manage this in another application like right. you right. yeah yeah right okay cool so the other thing that i wanted to mention is this thing which is the one we were missing the synthetics monitoring here so when it comes to the end user experience, like um, we do have uh, the JavaScript agent so that you can use for real user, user monitoring. So basically to understand the user experience when they are navigating through your website, for example, and everything that's been loaded, if there's delay and something like this, it can be tracked. Um, and then uh, you can just like leave it running and then if there's a lot of traffic you can see if like something is not loading properly uh, there and then do something with it the other thing that's possible and then it will be like the traces like even like the the part the the visualization part of it like in the end you use apm here and then uh, you have like the traces for rom2 and then when it comes to the end user experience, there is also the synthetics monitoring that is also an option. And again, all of this concept I'm sharing is not uh, something that we have, is actually something that it's out there. Uh, and then, uh, and for this specifically, it's really cool because you simulate access. So you don't need to have real users. So this will be like a different uh, experience here. So you basically simulate the, the access uh, for your web page, for example, and then you just click there, open there, like uh, there, if there is a form, you fill it out, you send this, so you can simulate users and you can simulate like the number of access, you can simulate how often, you can simulate from accessing from what server, uh, then there will be like some options considering like the providers that we use. And then you're able to uh, understand like the, the user jo user journey even like before having something out there, and you can do this with something out there too. If there is something that I mean, you will probably prefer to use this with real users. But consider that you might have like a testing version that's not out there yet, and then you want to test it. This is a possibility too. And also, like if you want to do this through a competitor's website, for example, to understand the performance that you won't have access to this, so you can like have like the traceability for their app, you can do this with synthetics monitoring too. So this is something else that you can do. So for example, uh, basically like for this, you can put, uh, you can like to do this for the Elastic uh, website. And then you select the location, as I mentioned. So North America. Oh, not, not Canada. Let me put US East. And the frequency, oh, we'll leave it there 10 minutes. That's fine. And then, so depending on the vendor you're using, you have a different uh, recorder. So for example, for Elastic, you just click here and download the recorder. I already downloaded this, so we don't need, but it's based on the operational system. So you can just check the ones and then install this. Once it's installed, what you do is you open this and then you enter the URL that you want to track. So for example, Elastic, Elastic Community, oops, sorry. Elastic community. Um, this, for example, this is one that we put the website. So basically, you get this website, we copy. Of course, there are some websites that block you from accessing this because it will consider this as a bot. So it's not something that you can do for every single website that's out there. And then you put, uh, start here 
it will open the web page and then I start simulating this. So I can click here into this event, for example, and then I click here in, the, in her bio. And that's it, now I close this. Okay, this is the journey. And then I can export this. I can just copy. Then I come here into the script editor. I paste this. I can also break this for more step. This is just one step, but if I want to see like for every single step in like separate views, you can do this too. And then you can run a test here to understand how long it's taken. And you can just leave it running to understand what's going on. So this is something else you can do. It's in progress. It will take a while here uh, to configure first, but then once it's configured, it's it started to it start to generate the, the steps here. Okay, it's here and here with all of the description. So this is something else you can do uh, when it comes to the uh, end user experience that I think it's important. That's it, <laughs> basically. Um, um, yeah, I think I could show something. Um, thanks for the time and sorry for the delay.